In a deep learning class where we'll be studying neural networks in great depth, it would be easy to forget that a neural network, or any machine learning model, is always part of a larger system. Before data can arrive at a neural network, it has to be collected and processed into a form that a neural network can understand. And the outputs that a neural network produces will often require post-processing or other analysis. And therefore, it will be extremely helpful throughout the semester to keep in mind the metaphor of the data analysis pipeline. This analogy reminds us that whenever we're doing machine learning, our goal is to turn observations of the world into predictions about the world, and that the neural network is just one step in that process. As we move from observations to predictions, the pipeline reminds us that we need to consider what stages our data goes through and how each stage feeds into the next. For different problems we'll be solving, we will need different stages in the pipeline. And sometimes when we're working with standardized or simulated data sets, we'll be able to skip certain stages entirely. But if we ever want to apply deep learning to real-world problems, we'll need to keep the realities of practical data analysis in mind. To make all of this more concrete, let's talk in more detail about some of the things that appear in common data analysis pipelines. Because doing machine learning requires having data to train a model on, the first stage in any data analysis pipeline is generally collecting the data. There will certainly be cases where we'll work with pre-existing data sets, but if you want to go out and solve some new problem with deep learning, you'll need to figure out what data can you use to train your deep learning model. And when you go and collect that data, you'll need to make sure that you have a reasonable amount. Mainly, this means making sure that you have enough data. And that's because the recent successes of deep learning have largely been based on the ability to train on enormous data sets. But on the other hand, when we don't have enormous amounts of computing power available, there is definitely such a thing as too much data. And especially in cases where we are doing exploration and trying to figure out what's even possible, it can be very helpful to work with a limited amount of data. But often the biggest challenge in data collection is making sure that the data set we're going to train on is representative of the problem we actually want to solve. This includes some obvious things, like making sure all of the classes we want our classifier to recognize are well represented among the data. But this can also include subtler issues, like making sure important outliers are not missed by the model. For example, a network doing computer vision for a self-driving car had better be able to recognize an Amish buggy and know that it's not moving as fast as a car. But it would be very easy if we're not being careful to construct a data set that doesn't contain that type of example. Even more problematic is identifying systematic biases in a data set. This can range from having too many pictures that were taken on sunny days, so your image classifier has trouble when it's cloudy, to predictions about outcomes in health or education that end up ascribing to an individual factors that are actually about broader social structures. And so there's an enormous range of ways that a data set can have some underlying bias, so we very much need to keep potential biases in mind when we are collecting data sets. But it's also worth noting that identifying and correcting bias is a hard problem that is the subject of lots of ongoing deep learning research. Once we have collected some data, there will often be a fair amount of cleaning up of the data that will be required before we can try to do any sort of machine learning or other processing on the data set. For example, there will often be dimensions of the data that are present for some data points and absent for others. If, say, our data set is based on health records, we might have blood pressure readings for most of the examples, but not all of them. And we'll therefore need to make a decision of whether that feature is included in the data set, 
And if so, how do we represent the cases where the data is missing? It may also be the case that some of the potential dimensions of our data are totally irrelevant to the problem that we're trying to solve. And if we include something like a patient ID number in our model, that's only going to create extra randomness and distract from the model's ability to learn the real underlying correlations. And in some cases, we may have a fundamental mismatch of the dimension of different examples in our data set. Think of an image processing task where we might want to include in our data set images of different resolution or aspect ratio. So we'll need to think about how can we take data that has different dimensions for different examples and use them as part of our training set for a single model. And a major pitfall if we are collecting data ourselves is how do we get appropriate labels for the data so that we can perform supervised learning? Suppose we were trying to transcribe speech in American Sign Language. If all we have is video of the sign language, then even if we speak sign language ourselves, it might be an awful lot of work to come up with the appropriate label for all of the data in all of the videos we want to train on. Or suppose that our videos were of a sign language interpreter, we might have a transcript of the speech that they were interpreting, but there might not be a one-to-one -one correspondence between what was said in sign language and what was said out loud in English. So we need to not only make sure that we have labels for our data, but that the labels really do indicate the things that we want our model to learn about the data. Once we have collected and cleaned a data set to the point where we think it adequately represents the problem we're trying to solve, we then need to turn the data into a format that will be as effective as possible for training our neural network or other machine learning model. In particular, this means encoding our data numerically. A neural network expects a vector or matrix of numerical data as its input. And we'll see throughout the semester that the problem of devising an appropriate numerical encoding for the data can vary wildly in difficulty from one problem to another. It turns out that processing image data is relatively easy because the underlying pixel-based representation that computers already use is great for machine learning. But when we want to process text data, the ASCII format that computers use to store text files is extremely unhelpful for a neural network. And so we'll want to think about alternate ways that the same data set can be represented. And the simplest idea I can give of transforming the representation of a data set comes from the linear models we've already seen, where to do good classification, we need data that can be cleanly separated by a linear decision boundary. And if we have here data in terms of dimensions x1 and x2, there's no easy way to draw a line that separates most of the blue points from most of the red ones. But if instead of representing our data in Cartesian coordinates, we transformed it into polar coordinates, where each data point is represented by a radius from the origin and an angle, now there is a very clear linear decision boundary that easily separates our two classes. But it's also quite possible that for a different data set, neither of these representations would let us easily draw a linear decision boundary. But maybe if we combined both of these representations, and even though our data started off as two-dimensional, we could turn each of those two-dimensional data points into a four-dimensional data point that included both the x1 and x2 coordinates as well as the r and theta coordinates, then in that higher dimensional representation, we could come up with a simple model to separate our classes. And this idea of changing the representation or even the dimension of the data 
can take on even more importance as the type of problem we're representing gets more complex. Another issue we'll encounter with numerical representations is that neural networks are very good at outputting values in the range 0 to 1, and because of the ways we tend to initialize weights and other parameters, it can also be helpful for the inputs to be in that range. And so if we have a data set that involves pixel values from 0 to 255, or numbers of people or amounts of money with very large numbers, it can be helpful to normalize the data where we squash the range of data values down so that the inputs to the neural network are much closer together. And then as a post-processing step, we have to denormalize and undo that transformation. There are many other possible types of preprocessing, but the last and most important that I want to talk about is splitting our data into a training set and a test set. The key idea here is that to make sure our model makes good predictions, we need to test it on data that it hasn't seen before. So we need to hold back some portion of our data set that the model doesn't get to train on, and then we can use that data when we are evaluating our model later. And this idea of splitting up the data set and the ways that we can use the test set to tune our model will be the core subject of our next video. But after data has gone through the neural network, there may also be post-processing steps that we want to apply. First, we will generally need to take the output of the neural network and turn that back into the type of prediction we're actually interested in. Since neural networks are good at outputting vectors of zeros and ones, if we had categorical labels in our training set, we might have transformed those into a zero-one encoding where each dimension of this target vector corresponds to a possible label, and the target would be zero for all of the dimensions except for the one corresponding to the correct label for that data point. So if we train our network to output this sort of one-hot vector, we would need to then decode that back into the label that we actually want as our prediction. We might also want, as a post-processing step, to convey information about how confident we are in various predictions the neural network is making. And we need to think about what will be done with the predictions that our model produces. For example, are they going to be interpreted by a human? like, say, a system that is trying to help a doctor make a diagnosis, in which case it might be a very good idea to produce plots or other visualizations that help a human to understand the data set or the predictions as a whole. Or is the output of our model going to be fed into some algorithm or other computation? like recognizing a vehicle that will then be part of the decision process for a self-driving car, in which case we need to think about the data representation that will be used by the next steps of the computation within which our model is embedded. And finally, as the deep learning practitioners who trained the model, we need to be thinking about what sort of validation can we do to check that it's working, and what sort of tuning can we do to help improve it. And for these sorts of analysis, we can take advantage of the data that we held back at the pre-processing stage, and these sorts of validation and tuning will be the subject of our next video.